what is up my youtube family welcome back to my channel if this is your first time here then it's just welcome now welcome back go ahead and hit the subscribe button because you will not be disappointed you know what i realized in my last video which is so unfortunate mother's tan is gone it is completely faded away girl and i'm so sad about it and i hit my friends up like girl we need another pool day because mother needs a tan and they're like girl it's raining and i pull up my weather app and sure enough like it's raining every day for like the next 10 days so I'm going to be looking a little melanin deficient, but that's fine. Also, before I get into today's story, what I want to do is say that um, I appreciate y'all riding for Bella like y'all do. I really do. But y'all got to, y'all really got to, we got to be honest here, okay? Y'all were like, where is the video? Where is the proof? Where is the evidence that Bella was doing anything wrong to be kicked out of daycare? I know my child, okay? I do. When that, when I dropped off, this is the thing. She got kicked out on her second day of daycare. The first day I dropped her off with my fingers crossed, fingers, toes, and eyes. And I'm like, please act right. Like, don't get put out. And when she didn't get put out, I was shocked. So I was like, okay, my baby might know how to act in public. Drop off the second day and two hours and 14 minutes into her stay. I look at my phone. I said, here we go. And sure enough, it was a uh, blue can stay. But this other one, you got to come get her. Like, she is a complete mess, okay? And she is. I know my baby. We working on it. Like... The thing is, Bella has a good heart. She is the sweetest little dog, but a menace to society. She is. Like, she's an antagonist for no reason, unwarrantedly. Like, let me show you what she did. So I bought, I'm put a little video right here to show y'all what I mean. I bought them both this, like, potato log rope. They have their own beds, and then they have a third bed. Plenty of space for them to lay around. Blue gets in his bed, cuddles up, and he is eating on his little, his little potato rope. And she decides she wants to switch she puts hers in the bed, stares at him. Well, he continues to chew his own. She just decides she wants to snatch his and try to run off with it. Like, why? What was the reason? Bella is an antagonist, okay? I know, I know my child. She's sweet, but she does start things, okay, all the time. She starts stuff with me. I can be laying down on my couch under a nice, cozy blanket, minding all of my business. Bella will walk into the room and look at me and as soon as i make eye contact with her like she'll stare for a couple more seconds and then next thing you know she's tugging at the other end of the blanket like trying to pull it off me for what like i feel like she does these little things like she antagonizes me and blue and in her mind like in the inside her head she's just giggling like he <laughs> just amused a long story short her antics caused three three dog fights within that two hour and 14 minute period they tried to separate her they tried to distract her like play with her a little bit to keep her from antagonizing the other dogs none of it worked and so they called me and was like come get her now my baby has been kicked out of school yep so bella is guilty y'all really tried it in my comment section somebody it wasn't her fault all on instagram capping for bella completely going to bad for bella meanwhile bella is bella but that's my girl and i love her so i ain't gonna give her too much but who i am gonna give a little bit too much is mr juan corona that is who we are talking about today he was a wild boy and we're gonna get into all of that hopefully my dogs don't snore up the background all right guys and gals today's video is about a man by the name of juan corona i believe i already said that but if i didn't that's his name. This case takes place in California. However, little Juan was born in Jalisco, Mexico on February 7th of 1943, and he is an Aquarius. 1934, not 1943. Juan is born one of 10 children to Sebastian and Sebastian's second wife. He also has three older siblings from Sebastian's previous marriage. So uh, it was a lot of them. The oldest sibling being his half brother from the previous marriage by the name of y'all do not wear me out because the pronunciation of this really evades me like I want to say Navidad so bad but that is not it it's not TV Dodd I don't know we gonna call him Nat because girl my Spanish is really it's really lacking and we know that okay we know that about me and we saw how Google really failed your girl last time I turned to her for a little help on the pronunciation completely led me astray I have nobody to turn to so he gonna be Nat for today. Nat migrates to California in 1944 when a lot of jobs became available after the World War II draft, which actually worked out for him. It proved to be a good decision on his part because he obtains work. He is able to save a lot of money, also send money home. And in 1950, when Juan turns 16, he actually sends for Juan to join him in the U.S. Child, but they don't do it the, the proper way. Juan drops out of high school 
and illegally migrates to California. Granted, I think during this time, it was kind of common for people to prioritize work and providing for their families over like finishing high school. So I ain't gonna give them too much there. Now Juan obtains work on local farms in the Imperial and Sacramento Valley areas. Now, Granny decided to give up his grade school education. What he did find to be um, important to learn was the English language. And so he also takes night school or night classes to become fluent in English. Now, three years later, in May of 1953, he decides to move to the Marysville, Yoruba City area at the urging of his brother, Nat. He is staying with Nat and working on a local farm there. And that same year, he meets and marries a young woman by the name of Gabriella. Now that is not something that he wanted at the time. He was not yet ready for such a commitment. However, at the urging of her parents, the two of them tie the knot because her parents said, what y'all not going to be doing is bumping and grinding, girl, without any kind of vows being taken. Okay, that's not what we're doing. Initially, the two of them thought that they could make it work, but they quickly realized that, yeah, no, y'all, either we are not ready for marriage or this is definitely not working out. And so just... Three months later, the marriage is dissolved and Lil Juan is single again, girl, and back on the prowl. He has a couple of relationships here and there, nothing serious for the next two years. And then in December of 1955, a flood breaks the levee and floods most of Sacramento Valley, including large areas of Marysville and Yoruba City, where he currently lives with his brother, Nat. Now, these areas are completely evacuated and declared lost at the time. Unfortunately, not everyone was able to make it out and a number of people are lost as a result many of which were undocumented Mexican laborers just like Juan himself and have been drafted to try to fix the levy before it broke which was very unfortunate. And Juan himself, he had already had this huge fear of water. And so this incident just makes it way worse. He becomes extremely paranoid. And things got so bad for him mentally that he ultimately suffers a mental breakdown and becomes convinced that everyone around him, or really everyone period, had died in the flood except him. Why he would be the chosen one to stick around, girl, I do not know. And that Everyone that he was seeing, including like his brother, co-workers, people he just passed on the street, all of them were ghosts that he was seeing, not actual real living people. I mean, it gets so bad that his brother has no choice but to have him committed. Juan is placed in a mental hospital in Auburn, California, where he is evaluated and it is determined that he suffers from paranoid schizophrenia. The hospital's method of treating paranoid schizophrenia at this time was child was old school okay they were doing all of the strange things in a period of just three months he receives over 23 shock treatments in an effort to cure him and is shortly after considered rehabilitated declared recovered and released back into the world child very possibly a little worse off than when he when he came in but you know they're the doctors and afterward he is released from the hospital but not back into the california streets okay he is instead deported right back to mexico and see the thing is juan didn't want to be in mexico okay he was over here in the states where he wanted to be and honey where there's a will there is a way he definitely had had a will to be here and he was not about to allow any of the things to stop him from living his American dream. Now he waits a couple of months but later that same year that he is deported he tiptoes right back over here into the United States, lays low for a little bit. Two years after returning to the U.S. he enters into his second marriage with a woman by the name of Gloria and with this new wife he has four daughters. Now Juan works really hard to support his family. He is a very trusted worker, very skilled and knowledgeable about the work that he does. So he is highly respected in that regard. But on the opposite side of the coin at home, he is a very volatile man. He has a terrible temper. He oftentimes gets pretty violent and he is obsessed seemingly with like proving himself to be this macho man. Like He absolutely loved showcasing his masculinity to all of the girls most times doing so by demeaning like outwardly 
openly gay males. Juan will always target these men and try to make them like the butt of the joke, try to berate them, like I said, demean them. They are always the target of his mischief and there is no HR for them to go to jail. So they just have to deal with it, unfortunately. Now, while this character flaw is often overlooked by pretty much everybody around them. His work ethic is not, and he is rewarded for his, his efforts. He is promoted. He becomes a licensed labor contractor in charge of hiring workers to staff local fruit ranches and farms in the area, doing the same type of work that he had started out doing when he first came over to the States. And he is actually really good at this. Like, no problems whatsoever. He has all of the farms staffed in the area and has a good working relationship with the farm owners. And he does this for the next eight years. For eight years, he goes without incident and things are seemingly in order for him until he suffers another schizophrenic episode that results in him needing to be institutionalized yet again. He spends just a couple of weeks there and then he is released back to his brother, Nat. And by this time, Nat had been working really hard since he came to the States, saving up his money because he eventually wanted to open up a cafe, which he's done so at this point. He has this nice cafe, living out his dream, honey. He invites his brother to come work there with him, where he can kind of, you know, keep an eye on him, but also provide him with work. Meanwhile, he is still working as a contractor, getting employees for the other farmers. At first, things are going really well. On May 25th, a young man by the name of Jose Romero is found very badly injured I mean, clinging to life in the bathroom of the cafe. He had been lashed across the face and the head repeatedly with a machete and nearly completely scalped. Juan's brother, Nat, is the one that finds him there and immediately calls for the police. Of course, he is rushed to the hospital to receive treatment and the police come out and talk to him so that they can tried to identify his attacker, but unfortunately he had not seen his attacker. So unfortunately he has no physical description to give to the officers and cannot think of anybody who would have wanted to harm him. So they don't really have much to go on to try to identify who could have done this and why. The attack just seemed completely random and unprovoked from what they were able to put together. They also speak with Juan, who was present at the time of the attack but unfortunately he is also unable to give a description or any information to help them identify who could have hurt this man. Now instead of really pushing the issue of identifying his attacker, Jose the victim, he becomes a little bit more preoccupied with suing the cafe and being paid for his pain and suffering. He files a lawsuit against the cafe and ultimately wins a $250,000 settlement. But see, Nat said, baby, I ain't got it, okay? He decides instead of paying this settlement to sell all of his little worldly possessions, honey, and just go right on back to Mexico where he'd come from. Nat said, 250K, I will go home, okay, before I remain over here and struggle to, to come up off of that. Now Juan remains in the States and decides to continue working as a contractor for the local farm. But just one year following the attack, on May 19th of 1971, one of the farmers notices something really odd on his property. There is a large, freshly dug hole in his peach orchard. Now he is the farmer, and shouldn't nobody be digging holes around there but him. So he has a meeting with his team to try to get down to the bottom of this. He calls upon all of his staff, all of which have been hired by Juan, and asks about the hole, but none of them knows who dug it, when it got dug, or what it's about. The man is upset about it, and rightfully so, and he cannot get this hole off his mind. Later on that night, he returns to his farm for something completely unrelated, but he thinks about this mysterious hole and decides to go check it out. And things just get a little bit more weird because now the hole has been filled. This gives him a terrible feeling in his little stomach, okay? He immediately calls the police and they come out to investigate. They get to digging and it does not take much before they unearth the body of a man by the name of Kenneth Whitaker. Kenneth is fully clothed, but when they check his clothing for some type of identification, the only thing that they could find is what was listed as gay literature. I don't know if it was a little poem. I don't know what gay literature is, but that's what they found in his pockets. And so they labeled this a 
sex crime. And what is also odd is they didn't even have the coroner like check for that to see if he had been assaulted in that way. They actually rarely do much of an examination at all. Just a really basic one. And just five days later after this discovery, another one of these freshly packed holes is spotted on another farm. Now, of course, you know, the farmers talk, honey. Word is spread around and this farmer wastes no time at all contacting police because he is sure of what this hole is about or at least what it contains. And he is correct. A second man is discovered. And not only that, a third freshly dug hole is spotted on that same farmland. And of course, a third body is discovered. Now on this third guy, they find a receipt for a meat market that has Juan Corona's name on it. And this is dated for just three days prior. Comparing the three, all three men had been hacked horribly, all in the same way and seemingly with the same large knife. And all of them were drifters who had sought employment working on the local farms. Now when police get to talking to people and, and trying to investigate, they find that multiple people had spotted a pickup truck very similar to Juan's in the area at night during the days that these discoveries have been made. But police, they're a little hesitant to move in on Juan. They don't want to move in on him just yet because they believe that there are potentially more victims out here. So before they decide to go out and try to make any type of arrest, they decide to scour the area and all the local farms just to see if they're correct, if there are any more of these holes on any of the land. And it turns out that they are absolutely right about there being additional victims. Six more are located on this second farm alone. And all of these men are found either with their pants down or having no pants on at all, like completely unclothed from the waist down. All of them have the same victim profile as the three before them. From the way that they were attacked down to the type of life that they lived, they were all drifters who had salt work as farm workers. And all of which had recently been spotted either riding on the back of Juan's pickup truck going off to a job or speaking with him inquiring about work. Now at this point, they decide to move forward with an arrest. So the following day, they go in and they arrest Juan. They also conduct a search of his home, his truck, and his office. Now during the search, they find an 18 inch machete, knives, a blood stained club, a pistol, a shovel, and one of the most damning little pieces of evidence that they find is a Yuba City meat market receipt that matched one found on victim number three. They also find a little book with 34 male names listed in no other context and they assume this to be like a victim list. Now the thing is, is this a list of completed victims or is this just a list of targets that you're checking off? Now some of them had dates that had already passed so they figured those must have been ones that had been completed already for lack of better words. Now, in addition to all of these things they also find blood stains inside of his truck. Now that they've made an arrest and they have a lot of evidence it's time to complete the search but they realize that this is a lot of ground to cover. Okay, it would take forever to do this on foot. And so instead, they have infrared photos taken by an aircraft and over the following week are able to locate an additional 16 bodies bringing his victim count to a total of 25. Because most of these men are drifters, they decide that the most efficient thing to do is to appeal to the public. If you have a loved one that you have not heard from that is missing, please let us know. And hopefully we can get all 25 of these men positively identified. Over 1,500 people reach out to them. 1,500 and still four of them are never able to be identified. Now, initially, Juan cannot afford an attorney, and so he is appointed a public defender. And I think the general consensus is nobody wants the public defender. Like, I feel like when you're facing time, the stereotype is that's the last thing you want. Because, girl, it just kind of gives, I'm definitely going to jail. But his public defender seemingly really put his best foot forward, okay? He enlists well, hires several psychiatrists to evaluate Juan and help 
determine his mental state at the current point. Mind you, he already has the, the diagnosis of paranoid schizophrenia under his belt. These doctors, they also agree with that diagnosis. And it is decided that the best strategy for Juan is to plead not guilty by reason of insanity. Like that is, that is the plan here. But the thing is, just two weeks later, his public defender is fired and he enlists the help of a private attorney. Now, he still didn't have no money. His financial state is the same. However, having the idea that a private attorney is better than a public defender, he decides to hire this new guy because he had agreed to represent Juan in exchange for exclusive literary and dramatic rights to Juan's life story, his life before the attacks, including the proceedings of the whole trial and his life thereafter. Now this new lawyer, he comes in and changes everything. He decides against the plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. We're not gonna play up your whole mental health issue. We're not even gonna mention it, okay? He fires all of the doctors that have previously been hired, tells them that their, their expertise and opinions are no longer needed. In fact, he makes no mention whatsoever of Juan's mental state. And and does not call on a single witness during this entire trial. Now this trial takes a lot longer than it should have for multiple reasons. The first reason being that Juan kept suffering heart attacks, okay? He had two back to back and had to be hospitalized for a period after each one. Then the state of California starts the process of abolishing the death penalty altogether, which is actually a good thing for Juan because he was definitely headed down that road. And finally, on January of 1973, his trial concludes and he is found guilty of all of the things, honey, 25 murder charges, and he receives 25 life sentences to be served consecutively. He is also denied the possibility of parole ever. But Juan catches another break. Yet another change to the law makes him eligible for parole after serving only seven years. They haul Lil Juan down to his jail cell, honey, and his wife, she holds on for a year before she decides to divorce him and take the kids on with her, leave him in the dust. And I don't know what it is about Juan and his luck with the law, but four years into his sentence, he catches yet another break when his lawyer is ruled incompetent. And so a lot of his, his trials had to be retried because he was... He was this incompetent man, girl, which of course includes Juan's trial. He is granted a brand new trial. Now his new trial, his new lawyer calls over 50 witnesses to the stand, but he takes a completely different approach than both of the previous lawyers. He decides that instead of going with the insanity plea, which makes the most sense, he is going to try to blame Juan's brother, Nat, for all of these murders. And he felt like it was no harm, no foul because Nat was no longer in the land of the living, okay? He had died a, a year prior over in Mexico. This new lawyer decided to use the incident that happened at the cafe as a reference. And it was, of course, Nat who had done it. It happened in his shop. They were never able to identify the attacker. And Nat is the one who found him and called the police. So to further push this narrative, he spends the majority of the trial painting Nat out to be this violent, raging homosexual capable of, of anything. But Juan really was not into framing his brother, dead or alive, child. He just was not into running his brother's name and memory and legacy into the ground. And so he admits to being with men himself, but he claims that it had only happened once and it had happened over in Mexico before he had ever come to the States and had not happened since. He also denounces the idea that his brother is even capable of this type of crime and likely responsible for any of this. Now, the main witness for the prosecution is another inmate that Juan had recently been introduced to. And according to him, Juan had admitted that he was responsible Responsible for all of the killings, stating, quote, yes, I did it, but I am a sick man and sick men cannot be judged by the same standards of other men. That's what he said Juan has said. And this whole thing is very much given the decoy situation from Mari. If you know, you know, like if you're an old girl like me, was it Mari that used to have the decoys backstage? Yes. But the cheating baby daddies, y'all know what I'm talking about. I think. Anyway, Juan's lawyer challenges this. However, he admits that the two of them have been acquainted and they have had a conversation very similar to this, but 
It was a hypothetical statement that Juan had made. If I had done this, I'm a sick man and sick men cannot be judged the same as other men. It was like hypothetically, like even if I did do it, he is adamant that his client did not say that. After seven long months and a lot of money spent on this trial, this was one of the most expensive trials to date. It cost the state of California over $5 million. But at the end of it, the jury finds him guilty, guilty of all counts just like the first trial. They completely dismissed the idea of his brother's involvement like 100%. Remember, Nat had been sued for everything and he packed up the little bit of belongings that he kept without selling and went back to Mexico a whole year before the first discovery was made. Juan's lawyer could not prove that he had brought his blood back to the US since. Like there was no way that he could tie him physically to any of these crimes. Shortly after the conclusion of Juan's second trial, he is attacked in prison by a group of inmates. And during this attack, he is stabbed over 32 times, most of which landed in his face and head and resulted in a blade being permanently lodged behind his right eye, causing him to completely lose sight in it. Juan makes several attempts over the years to be paroled. His last parole hearing was in November of 2016. And at this hearing, he admits for the first time before the courts that he had killed some of his victims. However, he did not admit to killing them all and the ones that he did kill he claimed he had done so because they were winos and trespassers and he had done so just out of having to do so like he didn't want to have to do it but it was necessary in the moment his argument was that it was all justified he didn't want to have to do it but he was really left no choice and so it's justified and he should be released he is of course denied parole at this hearing as well and this was his eighth attempt at parole and unfortunately for him his last because he died in prison on March 4th of 2019. It was due to natural causes because at this point he was 85. All right that pretty much concludes this video and this look. I really like this look. Every time I do like every time I have red hair I be feeling like a superhero and I feel like green just naturally pairs so well with red hair. So here we are you know, giving a superhero tea. All right, my microphone is about to die and Bella is about to cry, okay? She was just down here whining. You'll see it in the bloopers. Um, So I'm gonna wrap it up here. Let me know what your thoughts are on this case. Comment down below. Have you heard of this guy? Let me know what you thought about Juan and his, his fiasco. Like, I feel like he had a lot going on, definitely. Don't forget to like the video before you leave. Subscribe if you have not subscribed yet to the channel. Share the video with a friend. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. Not me getting brow stuff in my wig, Lord. Why? The eyebrow is really giving though. When a lot of bleh, he did decide that learning Spanish or yikes, he learned Spanish, girl. He knew Spanish already. And things got so bad for him mentally that he ultimately served services. And Juan works really hard to su survive. Girl, I guess, but that ain't what I was, that's not, that's not the idea I was trying to get across. His worth, worth, every time it's time for me to say work, work ethic, I just want to say worth ethic. Like why? Why my tongue want to do that? His worth, shit, I just did it again. My God, Blue, was it a rough night at work, baby? Now that they've made an arrest and have obtained, okay. 25 life sentences to be served con consecutively, which makes it justified and so, really Bella? Relax girl, my mic is already about to die. Like, don't give me more problems. I can't take no more. Super Shiro, heroin. Oh Lord, not that girl. Don't flag me, YouTube. I was talking about a female version of a hero, not the drugs. As always, I appreciate you so much for spending your time with me. And I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Peace. Why was I doing a gangster lean during the outro? I need to do it over.